The water type is one of the best types in Pokemon, but how good would it be in a hardcore Nuzlocke where any Pokemon that faints has to be boxed forever? I only get to catch the first water type I find per route, and unlike my opponents, I won't be allowed to Dynamax at all. I also can't overlevel the next gym, and because this is Pokemon Sword, we're immediately met with what's in my opinion the worst starter trio in the entire franchise. And to make matters worse, we're stuck with my least favorite starter of all time, Sobble. <laughs> I mean, seriously, the fact that none of these guys have a secondary typing is an insult that I took personally. I would say goodbye to my mom, but there's a grass-type Budu guarding the door. Budu! I am so out of here holy. And to make matters worse, the first gym leader, this inflated muscle toddler, is a user of grass types. Unfortunately, since this is sword and not shield, we can't catch a low tad on Route 2. Frustratingly, we're also barred from entering Route 5, so I can't get a dupe either either. And since my Sobble, now in his rebellious emo phase, will be of no help whatsoever, I I head to the wild area. I go fishing at Westlake Axwell where my encounter is the most probable Magikarp. I do this before I go fish at East Lake Axel since it eliminates a giant chunk of the encounter table and gives me the best possible chance to encounter Shelder. The only reason Shelder is one of the best encounters in this entire game is because of the early access to Waterstone. Most evolution stones are available just lying around in the wild area, so we can immediately evolve Shelder into Cloister. Not exactly sure what was going through their heads when they made this design. Another peak Gen 1 banger, what can I say? Now my current Hardcore Nuzlocke rule set doesn't allow for any setup moves. This means I can't use Shell Smash, which Cloyster has access to right away. With it, I'm pretty sure Cloyster could tear through the entire game on its own. But even without it, it's a really great Pokemon. Magikarp's a pretty awesome pickup too, since at the very first level cap of 20, we can already evolve into Gyarados. With both a fully evolved Flying and Ice type on the team, going into the fight versus Milo feels a whole lot better. Of course, his Gossifleur was never going to be a particularly large problem, and a couple of hits from Icicle Spear takes it out. Even with a move as strong as Skill Link, Icicle Spear I was still a bit worried about Dynamax Eldegoss, and because of Cloyster's modest nature, it does have a chance to fall short of a KO. However, the answer to my problem was provided in Turfield right before the gym. By solving a short overworld puzzle, we can pick up an expert belt to boost our super effective hits by 20%, and this boost to our damage output guarantees that Eldegoss goes down to 5 hits of Icicle Spear. With our first badge collected, we've gotta prepare for Nessa. My first move is heading over to the Isle of Armor to encounter a Quagsire. Quagsire is an amazing Pokemon no matter what up, but with Water Absorb, it can counter pretty much every Water type in the game. I then go to Route 2 to pick up a Choodle, which I can immediately evolve into Dreadnaw. This means we're ready to take on Nessa, and I'm about to give her a dose of her own medicine. Not just by using Water types, but taking out her first two Pokemon with Strong Jaw boosted crunches. Her own Duraludon is a bit more of an issue. I'm gonna have to stall this thing's Dynamax turns out to have a chance at knocking it out, so I start by tanking the first hit with my own Duraludon since I'm at full health, which doesn't do too much. I decide to do some damage with Rock Tomb to lower its speed, but in reality, I probably should have gone for maximum damage with an Earthquake. For the second Dynamax turn, I swap to Quagsire as she tries to use Max Geyser, which I absorb with my ability. For the final Dynamax turn, Dreadnought goes for Max Strike, which doesn't even deal half damage, and I fire back with a Yawn. Basically, this guarantees me the victory, since I can swap out into Gyarados, lower Dreadnought's attack, and just tank a Headbutt. Then once Dreadnought's asleep, I take it out with an Earthquake and get my second Gym Badge. Before we fight Kabu, we have to make our way through the epically named Galar Mine No. 2, where I pick up a Wimpod. I then start fighting my way through the gym puzzle where I get some help from a Roly Coley. Yeah, Roly Coley, maybe not the best name and maybe not such a great design. And look, I kind of get what people mean when they say Pokemon designs and names have gone downhill. But don't forget the classics like Electrode, which is just a ball called Electrode. Or Muck, which might as well be called Crap. Kabu, on the other hand, has fantastic taste in Gen 1 Pokemon. With Ninetales and Arcanine, his problem definitely isn't style, but rather that his matchup with Fire against Water is abysmal. Because of Burn, however, I do need to be a bit careful. Careful, so I equip Gyarados with a Rostberry before the fight to heal off the burn, which allows Gyarados to connect with a full power stab waterfall, taking out Ninetales and sending in Arcanine. Arcanine also has Will-O-Wisp and is thus also a problem. Despite the fact that it's faster than Gyarados and is able to burn me before I connect with an attack, and I've gotten my attack further lowered by Intimidate, I decide to stay in and go for a waterfall for just a little bit of damage. The reason for doing this is to guarantee I don't get Will-O-Wisp when I swap out into Dreadnought. Now, Dreadnought is also a lot slower than Arcanine, so after tanking a bite, I will have to eat a Will-O-Wisp the next turn, which is why I gave Dreadnought a Rostberry as well. This is the only way I could see switching in Dreadnought without getting burned and being able to take Arcanine out in the process. The reason I wanted to get Dreadnought in is it's our best option to 
counter Senta Scorch. Not only is Dreadnought faster and can deliver a stab quad effective Rock Tomb, it's also got fantastic defenses and quad resists fire, so we're guaranteed to be hit by a max Flutterby. From there, another Rock Tomb takes it out, but let's be honest, a fire type gym and a water challenge was never going to be a big problem. As I start making my way towards Hammerlock through the wild area, I stop at the digging duo to dig up some fossils. Then on Route 6, on my way to the next town, I can get my fossils put together into one of the most disturbing looking Pokemon of all time. Like I imagine designing this thing went something like this. Okay, look, how about we make this really disturbing, ugly looking Pokemon that looks like it should be spilling its guts out. You know, I'm really not sure that's what we're and, and we make it so absurdly broken that everyone has to look at it all the time. Okay, now we're talking. Is it weird that I kind of love this thing? Like seriously, with Strongjaw, this thing's insanely strong, but unfortunately it doesn't get its signature move until level 63, so uh, it's gonna be boxed for now. Instead, we have to prepare for the upcoming fighting gym, so I head back to the Isle of Armor where I pick up a Starmie. I also evolve Wimpod into Golisopod and Drizzile into Inteleon, but we don't talk about that one. B is actually a pretty formidable opponent, but she does have a crippling weakness to Starmie. Despite being another pretty janky Gen 1 design, it does have the benefit of being a Generation 1 special attacker, meaning it gets access to a plethora of incredibly strong special attacks. Between Stab Psychic and Dazzling Gleam being quad effective against Pangoro, her first three Pokemon simply don't stand a chance. As always though, her Dynamax Pokemon is a bit of a problem, since Starmie can't take out all that health with a Stab Psychic. Expecting a Max Darkness, I swap into Golisopod, who tanks it with its bug typing. For the second Dynamax turn, I just stay in and get a bit of damage with First Impression and get struck by another Max Darkness. This does get Golisopod below half health, but with a Citrus Berry, I can avoid being swapped out with Emergency Exit. On the third turn, it goes for the strongest move against Golisopod, Max Strike, which, even with a critical hit, isn't enough to take it out. And this way, it's actually good that I get Emergency Exited, since it allows me to send in Gyarados to get an Intimidate off and lower Machamp's attack before it shrinks to its regular size. From there, I can tank anything this Machamp throws at me, and a couple of Waterfalls is enough to grant me the fourth Gym Badge. At this point in the game, we're able to pick up a Choice Scarf from this old man, but it's also a pretty forgiving part of the game, since the next Gym Fight versus Opal is almost completely free, no matter what challenge you're doing, due to its gimmick. As long as you've got a Pokemon that can deal super effective damage, all you do is protect every other turn and answer the questions correctly to get all the boosts you need. As long as the fairy types aren't hitting super effectively, you can just keep launching those super effective moves and eventually you'll get the gym badge. After the gym, I head back to the wild area to pick up a Wingle. Now Wingle is an excellent encounter either way, but with a 50% chance to get Hydration, which turns into Drizzle once we evolve it into Pelipper, this thing is an absolute monster. With a Rain Setter, our water type team basically just got twice as powerful, and we're going up against a rock type gym leader. This gym fight would have been insanely easy to beat in the first place, but with the rain, we just completely wash Gordy's rocks away. Before we get to enter Spikemuth, we have to take on Marnie, but once again, Starmie proves to be an absolute monster. Her Lipard and Scrafty both get eliminated by Dazzling Gleams, and Toxicroak predictably falls to a Psychic. As for her electric type Morpeko, just like against Boltund, we just swap into Derpington and take her out with a few waterfalls. It seems our matchup against dark types is pretty good, which means we're probably going to do insanely well against Piers, especially since he doesn't use a Dynamax Pokemon. With Dynamax being by far the most threatening thing in a Nuzlocke of these games, Piers is usually a fairly easy opponent. So I plan to totally and utterly crush him. He starts with Scrafty, and since Stormy doesn't care about Intimidate at all, I just immediately take it out with a Dazzling Gleam. Second out is Malamar, so expecting a super effective dark move, I swap out into my bug type Golisopod. Golisopod is a perfect counter here since it not only resists dark with its bug type, but can also fire off a priority quad effective first impression to take Malamar out in one hit. Obstagoon comes in next and I get to swap in Dreadnought for free since it just goes for counter. Obstagoon goes for obstruct, which does stop it from being hit by quad effective superpower and lowers my defense by two stages. This means the throat chop it hits me with the next turn deals a massive amount of damage before I hit it with superpower, which just barely falls short of the KO. I then swap out of Dreadnought into Gyarados to get an Intimidate and thus tank the Throat Chop incredibly well, and then take out Obstagoon the next turn with an Earthquake. Finally, he's only got Skun Tank left, and while it doesn't fall to a single Earthquake, a second one does the trick, granting us our seventh Gym Badge. We always knew Piers wouldn't be that difficult, but Raihan coming up on the other hand could be a serious issue. Being a double battle gym with Dynamax, this is probably the battle that's caused me the most casualties in Generation 8. So before we just throw ourselves in, we gotta make some preparations. I start 
start by heading back to the Isle of Armor to pick up a Dragon Scale. I then head to the Insular Sea, careful to stay away from Sharpedos, which would otherwise be my first encounter, instead trying to hunt down what I'm really looking for, Horsey. Turns out my Horsey was holding a Dragon Scale when I captured it, so I didn't actually have to get the one in the overworld. But with said Dragon Scale, we're able to fully evolve it into Kingdra. For my final bit of preparation, I head back to Spikemouth, where I can pick up the Choice Specs. And so we're ready to take on the Weather Master Raihan, and at first I wanted to send in my own Weather Setter Pelipper, but since it's faster than Gigalith, he would actually win the Weather War. Instead, I send in Dreadnought and Cloyster, the plan being to bait a Body Press onto Dreadnought so that I can safely swap in Pelipper and set up the rain. I've then given Cloyster the Choice Scarf just so that it'll be able to outspeed Flygon and always take it out with two hits from Icicle Spear. My plan ends up working exactly the way I wanted to, and Flygon goes down. Even better, Gigalith actually goes for Body Press as planned, which barely does anything to Pelipper. Raihan then sends in Sandaconda, which is incredibly tricky since if I hit it with any move at all, it sets up the sand. So, instead of attacking, I go for a double switch, first sending in Gyarados to get off and intimidate and lower both of my opponent's Pokemon's attack. I'm expecting Raihan to want to go for a rock move against Pelipper, so I swap out into Kingdra. Sandaconda goes for Glare, which hits Gyarados instead of Kingdra, which is incredibly nice since Kingdra's got Swift Swim. Gigalith then sets up Stealth Rock, so I definitely pick the right time to switch. I do have to go for one more switch, however, but because Derpington is a ground type, it barely takes any damage from Stealth Rock at all. I then have Kingdra go for a Choice Specs boosted Stab Super Effective Rain Boosted Scald, which definitely is enough to take out Gigalith. Sandaconda goes for Glare again, this time unfortunately paralyzing Kingdra. And Raihan then sends in his ace Pokemon, Dureladon. Now that Kingdra's paralyzed and it could be hit by a Max Wormwind, I decide to swap out into Gyarados to at least get off and intimidate. The switch, however, does come at the pretty steep cost of a quarter of Gyarados's health. As expected, Duraludon does go for its G-Max depletion, targeting Kingdra. But after the Intimidate, it only does about another quarter to Gyarados. Sandaconda then goes for Earth Power, which barely does anything to Derpington, who fires back with a Scald, which just barely misses out on the KO, and unfortunately sets up the Sand. Gyarados is getting pretty low at this point, and I'm expecting it to get hit by a Max Rockfall, so I swap out into Dreadnought. Sandaconda then goes for Protect, so unfortunately, I won't be able to take it out this turn. As expected, however, he does go for the Max Rockfall, which barely does anything to Dreadnought. Now expecting it to go for a super effective Max Knuckle, I swap into my Flying-type Pelipper, which also has the added bonus of setting up the rain again. Unfortunately, its Flying-typing also means it takes a quarter damage from rocks, which isn't as great. As expected, Duraludon does hit me with a Max Knuckle, which barely does anything to Pelipper, and then gets an attack boost to offset the earlier Intimidate. Sandaconda once again goes for Glare, this time paralyzing Pelipper. Finally, Derpington goes for Scald, and being an absolute hero, also gets the burn. This means Duraludon, now out of Dynamax turns, is gonna be a lot easier to deal with. I start the next turn by swapping out Pelipper for Cloyster, who unfortunately takes a whole lot of damage from Stealth Rock. Sandaconda goes for Protect, and Duraludon hits with a Breaking Swipe, which lowers both of my Pokémon's attack. Finally, I try to take out Sandaconda with Derpington, but it went for Protect. Cloyster already outspeeds everything on the field, but with a Scarf, it's definitely the fastest, taking out Sandaconda with an Icicle Spear and unfortunately setting up the Sand. Duraludon then goes for Body Press, which I was at least expecting to hit Cloyster, but instead it does nothing to Derpington, who fires back with a high horsepower. It's not quite enough for the KO, so to seal the deal, Cloyster goes for a couple of Icicle Spears to take it out and win us the Gym Badge. Honestly, this fight is one of the most fun parts of Nuzlocking any official Pokemon game, so I really hope Game Freak put more double battles in Pokemon games in the future. With Ryan defeated, we actually have to prepare for the Elite Four, so I head back all the way to Professor Magnolia's lab to pick up the Choice Band. In the nearby lake, I search for a very specific Pokemon, Barrascuda. This thing is an absolute monster with not only incredible attack and speed, but also a great move pool. And the reason I'm getting it right now is it's perfect for the second fight of the Pokemon League, but first we gotta take on Marnie. Once again, we're facing a team of Dark Types, but this time, Marnie has a Dynamax. Pokemon. She also has a few other nasty tricks up her sleeve, so I start by going for Protect to avoid a fake out, but the Lipard just sets up a nasty plot. That's not really a problem since Lipard is only faster with priority moves through Prankster, so I can just take it out with a Dazzling Gleam. Scrafty comes in second, but it's quad weak to Dazzling Gleam, so it too goes down in one hit. Third out is Toxicroak, and I don't really want to play the guessing game around Sucker Punch, so I swap out into Toilet Seat. This gives us the added bonus of 
setting up the rain to boost our entire team. Toxicroak does go for Sucker Punch, so we end up getting the switch for free. However, it is still faster the next turn and poisons Pelipper with Toxic. That's not the end of the world, since Toilet Seat can whip up a Hurricane and take out Toxicroak in one super effective hit. Second to last is her more Pico, which of course threatens Pelipper with an electric move, so I swap out into Derpington to sponge it up with my ground type. Now that I know it isn't going to go for an electric type move next turn, I can freely swap out into Kingdra. One thing I managed to overlook is that it can go for Torment, which usually wouldn't be that big a problem, but Kingdra's wearing the choice specs. Not exactly ideal, since after I take out more Pico with Scald, I'm gonna have to swap out. In comes her Dynamax Grimmsnarl, so I decide to swap out into Gyarados to get that Intimidate and lower its attack. That's gonna make it a little bit easier to deal with once it starts launching max Starfalls. It does just under half to Gyarados, which means I'm at least free to stay in for one more turn. I decide to go for Protect, just in case I want to swap Gyarados in again to take as little damage as possible from the G-Max Snooze. I will have to switch since it yawns you as a bonus effect, but at least I get just barely into range where my Citrus Berry activates and gives me back 25% of my HP. Hoping she'll go for another G-Max Snooze, I swap in the Tormentor, but unfortunately, instead she decides on Max Starfall. Luckily, Golisopod's defense is massive, so even the incoming critical hit isn't enough to take it out. And in this case, Emergency Exit turns out to be incredibly useful, since I get to swap in Gyarados for free and get another attack drop just before Grimmsnarl shrinks back to its regular size. With Prankster, Grimmsnarl outspeeds and goes for Torment, meaning I can't go for the same move twice in a row, but after an Iron Head, Grimmsnarl's simply in range for a Waterfall to take it out and grant me the victory. The second fight of the Elite Four is the final rival fight versus Hop, and this fight is the perfect showcase of the awesome power of Barrascuda. I haven't the slightest clue why they thought it was a good idea to give this thing close combat, but it completely tears apart Double. Also, for some reason, Hop has replaced his Bolton with a Pincurchin, which is a very useless Pokemon that also just gets KO'd by close combat. Hop then decides to be a complete idiot, sending in Snorlax right into a Choice Banded close combat. Why he'd voluntarily do this instead of sending in his perfectly fine Corviknight is something we'll never know. Speaking of Corviknight, this thing's incredibly bulky and can probably handle even a Choice Banded close combat, so I swap out into Pelipper, which also sets up the rain. Corviknight goes for Scary Face for some reason, despite Barrascuta's terrible defenses and being at minus three defense. I've got no idea how this guy made it through the gym challenge. Nepotism must be alive and well. Either way, I send in Kingdra, which immediately gets swaggered upon switching, so I decide to swap out once again, this time into Gyarados. Gyarados gets immediately scary-faced on switching and then outsped and swaggered the following turn, so I'm forced to swap out again, but this way I just get to swap back in Dart. This actually kind of works out perfectly, since I now have the rain set up, and because I swapped out, I can switch up my moves. I lock myself into Liquidation since I get both Stab and the Rain Boost, but mostly it's because Hop's final Pokemon is Cinderace, granting us an easy victory. We now find out the Pokemon League staff are actually the bad guys, and Team Yell help me search for answers. Though admittedly, they're not much help. The fight versus Oleana is one of the battles that can be fairly devastating in Sword and Shield. You've always got to go into this thing with a plan because her speedy Pokemon can easily catch you off guard. I once again lead with Barrascuda since it outspeeds Frostlass and I can take it out with a single crunch. This baits in Serena and a single Expert Bell Poison Jab isn't enough to take it out, so I have to swap out into Gyarados to get that Intimidate. We can't swap into something like the Lysopod to resist its Grass-type moves because of Acrobatics. This means Gyarados is my most viable answer, even though I can only do about a third damage with Crunch. However, the combination of Gyarados' high defense and Intimidate means I can tank just enough hits to finally take out Serena with Crunch. For now, everything's going according to plan. I even equipped Gyarados with an Assault Vest so that the incoming Salazzle wouldn't take it out with a Venoshock. This way, we can efficiently go for a quad effective Earthquake to take out Salazzle the very first turn. Her second to last Pokemon is a very annoying Milotic, but unfortunately for Oleana, it only has one attacking move in Surf. For that reason, it might seem strange to set up the rain since that powers up its only attacking move, but it won't even be able to hit us once we swap in Derpington with Water Absorb. This guarantees that we win this matchup, but it's still going to be incredibly annoying and time consuming since Milotic has both Recover and Aqua Ring. It also has Safeguard and once it sets that up, there's really no point in going for Scald anymore since we can't get it burned. Instead, I opt to go for Liquidation while we still have the rain up to potentially get defense drops to do even more damage. It doesn't matter in the slightest that we boost its special attack since it can't attack us anyway. It took forever to try and stall this thing out of recovers, but eventually I just got enough defense drops that an Earthquake took it out from the health it was at. This just leaves her with her Gigantamax Garboder. However, it's unable to do half to the bulky Quagsire and Earthquake does over half to it, so Oleana ends up being a much easier victory than usual. 
This means we have to take on the gym leader rematches, but first, we're randomly challenged by Bede. Fairy is probably the only type that's better than water, so going into this fight, you kinda have to be careful. Luckily, I came to the fight with a plan, first sending in Toilet Seat to set up my Drizzle and also eat up Intimidate. I then swap out into Gyarados to get an Intimidate of my own. This guarantees that what I swap in next takes less than half damage from a non-crit play rough. The only reason this is a really important in-between play is that play rough can lower your attack, and as I send in Dart, I really don't want his attack lowered. And because I can now survive two hits, this means I could swap out and swap in again to potentially not have my attack dropped. As long as my attack isn't dropped, however, Choice Band Liquidation in the rain is actually straight up just enough to take out every single one of Bede's Pokemon, including his Dynamax Hatterini, in a single hit. If you're for some reason not sold on Barrascuta as a team member yet, I recommend you rethink that position. The first actual Gym Leader rematch is versus Nessa, and because she uses Water types, it's more important than ever to establish dominance, since there can only be one Water type master. I start by going for Protect with Starmie, since Glycopod could potentially go for the priority first impression, which would immediately take me out. Now that we're guaranteed to outspeed, I fire off an Expert Belt Thunderbolt, taking Glycopod into the yellow and even getting a Paralysis, but importantly, we send it away with Emergency Exit, which sends in Sea King. I'm unsure if I can take Sea King out with a single Thunderbolt here, so I swap out into Gyarados, since I really don't want to be knocked out by a Megahorn. However, I wouldn't have been punished for just sending it, since the Sea King just goes for Aqua Ring. Sea King really can't hurt Gyarados, so a couple of Earthquakes later, and and the King of the Sea is down. Nessa then sends in her own Barrascuta. At least hers doesn't have close combat, so I can fairly safely swap in Cloyster to tank a Throat Chop. Barrascuta of course outspeeds being the speed demon that it is, but it doesn't even get clammed down to half health, and I can fire back with a Pin Missile, which unfortunately, even with five hits, isn't quite enough to take Barrascuta out. A bit unfortunate, but all this means in practice is we have to take one more hit, taking Clam below half health, before I can take it out with another Pin Missile. Next, she sends back in Golisopod, so I take the opportunity to swap out into Pelipper. This sets up the rain, which I guess helps her out as much as it helps me. Golisopod just goes for resisted first impression, which doesn't do too much at all, and I can go for a 100% accuracy hurricane, finishing off its remaining health. This means Nessa's guaranteed to send in her second to last Pokemon, Pelipper, so I take the chance to swap out into Kingdra. With plenty of turns of rain left, Kingdra's guaranteed to outspeed everything even if the Pelipper sets up a tailwind. I end up going for Scald, even though it's a resisted hit, in the rain and with choice specs it still does a ton of damage, allowing me to take out Pelipper in a two-hit KO. However, the main reason for locking myself into Scald is since it's neutral against Dreadnought, and I even managed to get a burn, which funny enough does just enough chip to allow me to two-hit KO. With Nessa defeated, our next gym leader rematch is versus B, and this time her fighting types are actually at a way bigger disadvantage than last time. I send in Pelipper first, which sets up the rain, but this also guarantees that Halucha goes for bounce, since its only other moves are fighting. This gives me a completely free switch into Kingdra, and the reason it's completely free is because Hurricane can never miss in rain, even if the opponent's up in the air. I mean, it really makes sense if you think about it, but now that we have double speed Kingdra with Specs Hurricane, every single one of B's non-Dynamax Pokemon simply get destroyed. The only somewhat threatening Pokemon on her team is her Gigantamax Machamp, which somehow doesn't actually take too much damage from a Specs Hurricane. But even so, a Max Chi Strike doesn't do that much damage to Kingdra. I follow it up with another Hurricane which just barely falls short of the KO, but at least gets the confusion. Unfortunately, of course Machamp doesn't hit itself in confusion, and very confusingly goes for Max Flare, but then when I thought about it, it makes a whole ton of sense. Because Max Flare sets up the sun, it weakens all of my water types, and it means that Hurricane won't be particularly accurate, so I'm forced to swap out, getting an Intimidate with Gyarados. B decides to use her last Dynamax turn by healing up Machamp, and then it goes back to its normal size. I try to deal as much damage as I can with Gyarados, but eventually Machamp takes Gyarados too low with a critical hit. This is fine, since all I have to do is swap into Pelipper, set up the rain, and then take out the Machamp with a 100% accurate Hurricane the following turn. The final Gym Leader rematch is versus Raihan in another weather war. This time he leads Torkoal, so sending in Pelipper would be stupid since he would end up getting his weather since he's slower. Instead, I plan something incredibly sinister, sending in Derpington to swap out into Toilet Seat as he tries to charge up Solar Beam. However, once the rain is set 
setup, Solar Beam becomes a two-turn move and he just wastes his turn. He never even gets to fire it off since a Rain Boosted Scald is all it takes to knock Torkoal out. Predictably, he then sends in Gudra to try and strike me out of the sky with a 100% accurate Thunder. Sadly, his Gudra suffers from Milotic Syndrome and only has Thunder and Water type moves, meaning it can't hit Derpington at all. I go for an Ice Punch, which only does just above half, so I give Gudra a turn to waste on Rain Dance and take it out with a second Ice Punch. With Gudra defeated, he sends in his Sand Setter, Flygon. The thing about Raihan is he loves prioritizing setting his weather, so I expect him to just go for Sandstorm here, which doesn't even hurt Quagsire, and then I just take him out with a quad effective Ice Punch. Second to last is his Turtonator, but once again, since the sand is up, I expect him to set up with Sunny Day, so I just go for Earthquake, which almost takes it out. Torkoal then sets up the sun, but because Derpster is faster, this is just a free KO. Once he's Gigantamax Duraludon, I go for Protect the first turn in order to take a lot less damage from a G-Max Depletion. He then boosts his attack with Max Knuckle, which I would do too if I couldn't even take Derpington below half with a critical hit. The attack boost is a little bit dangerous, but at least I can fire back with an Earthquake for about a third of its health. I then go for another Protect, which means the final Gigantamax move barely deals any damage at all. I then swap out of Derpington into Gyarados, which neutralizes that attack boost with an Intimidate, meaning the incoming Dragon Claw does very little. I now, however, expect it to go for Stone Edge, so I swap in Donatello, who takes it beautifully. Duraludon then goes for a super effective Body Press, getting incredibly close to the first death of the run, but Duraludon holds its ground, firing back with an Earthquake, taking out Duraludon with a critical hit, meaning that we made it all the way through the Elite Four without losing a single Pokemon. However, the toughest two battles of the game are still ahead of us as Rose reveals his evil plan to induce the darkest day. And so I'm left with no choice but to confront the chairman myself. I've got no clue why he wants to let loose Dynamax Pokemon, because I just mashed through the dialogue, but he's gotta go down. Water types do resist Rose's Steel types, but even still, this isn't that great a matchup for us. In particular, his Ferrothorn could be a massive problem. As per usual, I try to set up the rain as fast as possible to boost the power of our water type moves. I then go for a Scald, which seems to be doing just under half. This Escavalier isn't that big a threat to us though, since it only has resisted moves. In fact, it just goes down to the next hit, being a higher roll. Predictably, this baits in Rose's Kling Clang, which has Wild Charge, so I'm forced to swap out of my Water Flying type into Derpington, who can avoid taking any damage at all with its Ground type. It doesn't take very many turns from there to take it out with a few Earthquakes. Unfortunately, with Quagsire being weak to grass, Rose's next Pokemon is Ferrothorn, and this thing could be a massive thorn in my side. Expecting it to go for Power Whip, I do go for Protect, just in order to get a bit of extra leftovers recovery in case we might need it down the line. I then pivot switch into Gyarados to get off and Intimidate, and because of Gyarados' flying type, we wouldn't take too much damage from Power Whip, however, we end up avoiding it altogether. I then swap out into Kingdra, but with its attack lowered, it decides to boost its attack and defense with Curse. I know Kingdra can still tank a hit, so I go for an Ice Beam, which unfortunately does less than half. Rose doesn't go for it though, and continues to set up his attack with Curse. He still can't knock me out with a non-crit Power Whip, so I go for another Ice Beam, taking him deep into the yellow as he continues to set up with Curse. This is perfect since Kingdra is still at full health and another Ice Beam is enough to take Ferrothorn out. That's definitely the biggest problem on his team dealt with. Second to last is his Perserker, so I swap out into Golisopod who can resist a Throat Chop. Somehow, Golisopod is also faster than this Perserker and I Brick Break for over half health. Perserker then just misses a Screech, allowing me to take it out with a Brick Break the following turn, leaving Rose with only his Gigantamax Kaparaja. With a base attack of 130, this thing could still cause me some issues, so I start by swapping in Gyarados to lower its attack with Intimidate. This switch ends up working out a lot better than I expected, since Rose decides to go for Max Quake for some reason, which can't even hit Gyarados. I then go for Earthquake to deal as much damage as possible, but I can't quite manage to get a two-hit KO. Max Mindstorm deals a lot of damage, and with the Psychic Terrain, it'll take Gyarados out the next turn, so I swap out into the Vish. With his final turn of Gigantamax, Rose goes for another Max Mindstorm, but even if he got a critical hit, there's no way he could take out the Vish, which means with a final earthquake, we claim victory and Rose's plans are foiled. Or well, we have to watch the anime doggos take out his spaceship demon, but uh, then his plans foiled. And so I had made it, deathless all the way to the final battle versus champion Leon. As long as we make it through this fight, we win the run. But if we make it through this fight deathless, we win with style. And it would prove once and for all that the water type is probably the most OP type to Nuzlocke with. Champion Leon, taunting us with questionable hand gestures, is a formidable opponent. His team is stacked full of hard-hitting Pokemon, so getting through this fight deathless would require insane precision. His lead Aegislash is incredibly annoying to deal with using 
and physical attackers because of King's Shield. But with Earthquake being a non-contact move, we actually don't risk anything by just spamming it. I've given my lead Quagsire an Assault Vest to be able to tank this Shadow Ball a little bit better, but because Aegislash is an attack stance, we just take it out in one Earthquake. The second point of leading with Quagsire is to bait in Rillaboom as the second Pokemon. This is of course a big problem for Quagsire, so we've got to swap out, but it gives us the perfect opportunity to swap in Toilet Seat and set up the rain. I was counting on getting hit by drum beating here, but for some reason, Leon goes for Endeavor twice. Not only can I not wrap my head around that at all, but it also lets us take out Rillaboom for free with a Hurricane. This perfectly baits in Dragapult completely according to plan, allowing us to swap out into Kingdra against a Thunderbolt. Because of Swift Swim, Kingdra is way faster than Dragapult, and a super effective Specs Dragon Pulse is more than enough to take it out. Because of Kingdra's weakness to Dragon, Leon conveniently sends in Haxorus, which for the exact same reasons as Dragapult, falls to Swift Swim Choice Specs Dragon Pulse. With now only two Pokemon left, Leon sends in Rhyperior. Unfortunately, Specs has us locked into Dragon Pulse, so I swap out into Gyarados in order to get an attack drop, but we conveniently also dodge an Earthquake. From here, I've got a master plan, but it requires me to stall out Stone Edge, so I start by going for Protect to burn the first PP. I then swap in Quagsire, who can resist it, but Rhyperior ends up missing. Expecting an Earthquake, I can get a second attack drop with Intimidate and bait the next Stone Edge and go for Protect. With now only two Stone Edge PP remaining, I swap out a Gyarados into Quagsire again to tank the fourth hit. It'll now go for Earthquake, once again, so I take the chance to set up the rain by swapping in Pelipper, who of course can't be hit by Earthquake. With the rain set up and only one Stone Edge remaining, I feel comfortable sending in the Vish. Dracovish is holding a Choice Scarf, and the way its signature move works is its double power if you outspeed the opponent. I watch as Leon's Charizard fills up the stadium. The monstrous creature towers over the Vish, but with a Choice Scarf, Dracovish is guaranteed to outspeed and do a minimum of 196% of Charizard's G max health and so i'd done it i'd beat a deathless pokemon sword hardcore nuzlocke using only water types the power of water is insane and while i'm ecstatic about having beat this run deathless i'm just glad i didn't have to use the Saba line in a single battle